Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag installment. The mailbag show, if you will, here at AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News. Thanks a lot for joining us today here on this beautiful Saturday. We're glad that you decided to make us a part of your weekend. Now, for those of you who don't know, haven't watched before, Every day on AMC Movie Talk, Monday through Friday, we take a little bit of time at the end of the show to take one or two questions from you guys from our mailbag. But we get like a thousand questions a week, so we started this mailbag show on the weekends to do nothing but take your questions. And I'm really glad today that I'm not doing it alone. I'm joined today by one of the newest team members here at AMC Movie News, Mr. Christian Larloff. Christian, how you doing? Uh, great, John. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to do mailbag. Yeah, this is going to be great. I'm so excited. You know, uh, for those of you who don't know, Christian and Miri and Alicia joined the team last week, and I am just beside myself. I'm just thrilled. This has been great. And I hope my eyes are starting to bug out already, so I'm going to put my glasses on. There we go. <laughs> all right, so we are going to start off uh, this show. Like I said, all we do is take your questions. And by the way, if you've got a question or a comment you would like to us ask us on the show, either you know Monday through Friday or on the weekends, email us at this email address right here, at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. So anything you want on, send it in, and maybe you'll see your question on the show. So for now, let's get to it with question number Number one, and the first question today comes to us from Michael Hackett, who writes, Hey guys, love the show. My question is about Shailene Woodley and The Amazing Spider-Man. Due to the success of Divergent and the filming of Insurgent and Allegiant, do you think we will still see her as Mary Jane in the future Spider-Man films? If not, who do you think should play Mary Jane in the future Spider-Man films? Uh, well, I mean, Christian... What do you think? Do you, do you think with everything that's going on that we are going to still see Shailene Woodley as Mary Jane moving forward? See, I don't know if it's as much if we're going to uh, not see her because of her schedule as much of it's like, hey, you guys had me. You didn't use me. And there are we don't really know the real rumors, but the real reasons behind why she left the film. Some people say they didn't like what they shot with her. Some people say they didn't want to fit it in because they wanted to have it for another movie. So um, I, I don't know if we're going to see her. I would like to see her. I love her. I think she's great. She, I loved her in Spectacular Now. I, I liked her in the Divergent film. So um, I hope she'll be back at this point. I don't know if she will. And I don't know yet who I'd like to see. If not her. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I'm not sure either. Now, for those of you, a little bit of background for those of you who may not know. So Shane Lee Woodley was cast as Mary Jane and they shot a bunch of scenes with her for the movie. Now, then at some point, Mark Webb said, you know what? This is the official statement at any rate. He said, you know, something pretty significant happens in this movie. And we felt that after watching it come together, that introducing Mary Jane at this point considering this very big event that happens in the movie, we felt it was rushing it, bringing her in for, for certain emotional reasons. And so <clears throat> we decided just to cut Mary Jane out of the film because we didn't feel the timing was right to have Mary Jane. That's the official explanation given by Mark Webb. And honestly, knowing what he's talking about, and for those of you who know the comic books, you know exactly what Mark Webb is talking about. Um, so for those of us who knows what he's talking about, I buy that explanation. Now, there could be something else behind it. Maybe they, I mean, people are speculating maybe she wasn't working out in the role. Right. You know, Christian, you and I have both heard that. Maybe she wasn't working out. They decided to cut her. I have a, I have a hard time swallowing that idea. I don't think they would do that. Um, but when, the part you raise in your question that is really interesting is the whole point about with Divergent being a success... You know, is is this going to really tie her up now? Is she going to be available? Lots of actors do lots of movies all at once, uh, but I mean, this could be busy for a teenager. And I, I gotta agree with Christian. I don't, I don't know that I really, I haven't thought about it a lot. Like, I don't know if we had to speculate though, Christian. What what are some names you could just pull out? Like, could you see like a Mila Kunis as nah, Mary Jane? No, neither so, can I. Neither can she's I. So overused. Um, I mean, I think that I'd like to see someone a little younger too. It's just the fact that. But let me ask you a question though, John, because don't, don't you think normally when it comes down to movies like this, especially a character as big as Mary Jane. Don't you think you signed Shailene Woodley to three or four pictures right away? And if that's the case, why didn't they do that? And and their agent, the agent, when signing the Divergent deals, would have to go around. Well, she's going to be doing the new Spider-Man movie, so I, you know, it kind of the rumors seem a little bit more realistic that it wasn't working out. Because why didn't you sign her a big deal? I have a feeling though that this is probably something like a Marvel situation. I got a feeling they she probably did sign for a three or four picture deal. But remember, I mean. 
in these, this is like NFL contracts, right? No contracts are guaranteed. Like signing a five picture deal just means that if the studio wants you in five films, you got to appear in five films. But if the studio don't want to use you anymore, they don't need to. So, but, but you raise a great point though, Christian. I mean, if, you know, you, the figuring, assuming they signed her for a multiple film deal, Right. Um, wouldn't they be able to just say, well, too bad that you're exactly. supposed to sign, you know, film Allegiant and whatever else. So I don't know. It. I still believe the basic explanation given by Mark Webb. But the question that you just raised does put some some clouds over. So I don't know what's really going on. I don't know. I don't think we're going to see her in, in future Spider-Man films. Yeah. I really don't. What about Haley Steinfeld? She's great. And you know yeah. what? She, I like that name a lot. I, I'd, go, I'd be okay with a Haley Steinfeld. I mean... I, what's her age difference with Mar with uh, Andrew Garfield though? Well, he he looks like he's twenty one, but I think he he's like thirty two. Yeah, he um, is. He yeah, he's he's older, but she she's starting to get a little older. I mean, again, like if I don't know if you could do um, Emma uh, Emma Watson is she is she maybe a little too, too big of a name and too big to attached to a franchise like with Harry Potter already? But I wouldn't mind seeing someone new, someone that we don't necessarily need to have a, a, a big name behind at this point, because you got so many. I mean, everything that's going on with Sinister Six and and these and the Spider-Man movies. I don't know if you need a huge name to do it. You just need a capable actor. Agreed. Agreed. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Dalton Irvin, who writes. With the new trailer and with his age, I have a feeling that Quicksilver will not be Magneto's son in X-Men Days of Future Past. This really saddens me because the best part about Quickie is his relationship between him and his father. My question is, why use him if the main reason you should won't even be part of the movie? Just sad to me. Thanks, uh, what, uh, thanks for what y'all do and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot, Dalton. I mean, you're right. One of the big reasons that I don't like the fact that... Um, Joss Sweden, all hail Joss, uh, is is using Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch in the Avengers because I, I don't feel they belong there. I feel if you're good, if they can only be in one place, I believe they belong with the X Men because you know they're Magneto's children. I believe that's a really rich thing, and I agree with you, Dalton. I the feeling I got from these amazing trailers is that he is not going to be Magneto's son, and so you raise a great question. Well, if he's not going to be Magneto's son, why use him in the first place? The only thing I can think of, having not seen the movie yet, is it serves the story. I mean, we see in that in that last trailer they gave that part of this movie is going to be the big breakout of Magneto out of the Pentagon. And, you know, Wolverine suggests, I know a guy. And you, you need a speedster. And so I can only assume, once again, not basing this on anything, that Brian Singer and, and the, the folks at Fox said, well, you know what, what, what serves this story well Quicksilver serves that part of the story. So even if we don't use him as Magneto's son, he serves the story. And that's the best movie. The best movies are the ones that pick their characters that serve the story, not just to highlight the character. So, but once again, I'm just speculating. Christian, do you think they should have bothered using Quicksilver if they're not going to make him Magneto's kids, or do you see value in it anyway? I see value in it as well, too, because again, like, I, and I understand the gripe with diehard fans because it's, it's you're, ta you're taking out a crucial element of a story that, you responded to and that people responded to obviously and and when you don't use that as a fan who you know got into the story you could see where you let down but on the other hand someone going into it that doesn't know the storyline that Magneto was his father depending on how it's executed in the script you won't care if you don't know it, it was <laughs> never you're, you're, you're an ostrich with your head in the sand you, ne you never knew because they executed the right way now if he just comes off looking like like I said on AMC Movie News like somebody who's just lost at Coachella because you look at this guy <laughs> his, his outfits are horrendous um, if, if they if, if the story fits the look then I'm worried but as of right now with the trailers and everything I think think that his ability is going to fit the story yeah i agree with you completely all right let's then move on to the next question today and the next one today comes to us from blake Z wow blake <laughs> zaitanowski i'm sorry if i'm butchering your name blake forgive me um hello everyone at amc you all make my life complete where do you want the spin-off star wars movies to go do you want the prequels to be uh, rebooted in 10 to 15 years? And is it likely to happen? I see so much potential no matter how bad they are. Thanks a million. Well, let's, uh, I, I can't really answer where do I want the prequels to, or the, the, the new films to go because 
I mean, it's a blank canvas, man. I, I'm just excited to sit back and watch and see where they're going to go with it. You know, I don't want to create any preconceived notions in my own head about this is what they need to do. Now, if you were to ask me if I had total power over Disney and Lucasfilm, I want them to do the Heir to the Empire series. That's what I wanted. But it's okay if they don't. And I'm just really excited to see where they're going. Now, as far as your question is, will they reboot the prequels? No, because the prequels, as much as I don't like them, they're here and they're a part of the story, whether I like it or not. They're there. And this story, as we know, is now ongoing. You, do, you can't reboot things in an ongoing story, you know? So I don't think they're going to reboot the prequels. I don't think they'll ever do it, as a matter of fact, especially considering the fact that now for the, for the next 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to have new Star Wars movies adding to the timeline as opposed to rebooting it. But anyway, Christian, how do you see it? I agree with you. I, I don't think it's going to happen as far as uh, rebooting the prequels, as wonderful as that idea sounds. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's there's no reason to do it for them right now. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if Lucas said something in the meeting where one of the things that you guys have to agree on is you don't touch those. It serves the story. It serves mm -hmm. the, it serves what's going to happen in the future because we're getting spinoff films and, and the history is the history. we got to deal with it. It is what it is. Um, as far as you know, I, I don't necessarily like say this is what they have to do for episode seven, but I sure hope they do a lot of stuff. And yet, do I? The one thing with the heir to the empire idea that I, it's just it's just tough because they already announced it will take place. It's official that we know that it will take place thirty years later, right. and heir to the empire takes place, I guess, like three years later or something. Yeah, along but those nothing lines. says they can't fudge the timeline. Like it's that's thirty years correct. later. That's, that's when Thrawn comes in. Absolutely, you can cherry pick. From yeah. heir to the empire, like yeah. again, there are rumors of Mary J Mary Jade. She could be older. All that stuff. I'd like to see some of the. There's a lot of cool story elements uh, to that entire trilogy. That would be great to see. What I would like to see is, for at least for the first movie, I like to see him keep it simple, like Episode Four. Episode Four was very, very simple. It was, it was. Hey, there's a princess. She's got to get rescued by this guy. There's a <laughs> villain. And then there's a big battle at the end. And that's what we made so... And then you got to elaborate as the stories went on. I want to see something simple again to get us back into that space opera feel. No, I, I completely agree. And you're right. There are a lot of things that can cherry pick from. And we talked about this on a Star Wars podcast that, that you do once before. Is that the beautiful thing here is that we have the Star Wars expanded universe that is not canon, but that doesn't mean that these that that Lucasfilm and Disney and J.J. Abrams aren't free to like I love your terminology, cherry pick from these things, pick out some great story elements that will fit in their story. I'd love to see Mara Jade. I'd love to see their child, Ben Skywalker. You know, I'd yeah. love to see all that. There's a lot of really cool things they have to draw on. I hope they don't exclusively rely on expanded universe stuff. Give us something new and original. But if it's going to serve the story, take some elements from the expanded universe because there's some pretty cool stuff there. All right, let's move on to the fourth question today. And the fourth question today comes to us from Bao Polkowski, who writes, Have you heard of the James Franco Jonah Hill Project True Story? If so, can I hear an opinion? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't know a ton about it. Like I, I do know the film revolves around, uh, a guy played by Jonah Hill. Who's like a journalist. And there's this guy on the FBI most wanted list who is actually living under that journalist's name somewhere. And then the two meet and develop a relationship. And it's kind of based on that. It looks like this is going to be a straight drama, uh, which I, I think James Franco's really good in. I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, Jonah Hill. Cause even in Jonah Hill's you know, dramatic movies, whether it's like Moneyball or whether it's Wolf of Wall Street, his character has still always kind of been comedic um, in those. It would be very, very interesting to see this multiple Academy Award nominee actually in a dramatic role. Um, and for that reason alone, like Rupert uh, Gould, who's directing it, I think this is going to be his first major film that he's directing. So I don't really feel one way or the other about that. But I I'm, I'm most curious about this film, if for no other reason than I want to see Jonah Hill in a role like this and see what he can really bring to a dramatic piece. Anyway, Christian, what do you know about the film? I don't really know anything. Now, I, I, I know everything I know from the description you just gave, to be honest. <laughs> um, but it sounds cool. And it's one of these things. Look, here's what Jonah Hill did for me. I... Thought for a very long time, thought he was a one-trick pony, uh, super bad, and all that stuff. He was he was funny, but it was always like he was just relying on the same shtick. 
from what he did in Moneyball, and then I he be, he jumped up on another level with me in The Wolf of Wall Street. I loved him in that film. I'm from New York. I have never heard someone hit a New York accent the way that guy hit it. He was so good. <laughs> I reminded me of everyone I went to high school with. Um, he was so good, and what I I agree with you in that I like to see him do more. But I do think he's always going to have his humor there because every actor yeah. brings a piece of themselves to every role that they do. I think that his humor and his sarcasm, even if he doesn't mean to do it, will always be there. Like even when like Ben Stiller does a does a movie that's dramatic, it's it's still there. Jim Carrey, the same thing. Um so I would like to see him maybe go a little more even more serious than he did in Wolf, but uh but yeah, I mean him and Franco teamed up, that sounds pretty cool. I, I'd like to see the first trailer. All right. Let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Paul Hardy, who writes, Hi, AMC family. Please continue uh, s- Please continue satisfy- to satisfy my movie addiction. I recently watched an interview with Morgan Freeman, and uh, he-, he said he was unhappy that he didn't have much screen time with Johnny Depp while filming Transcendence. This got me thinking. My question is, which two actors would you love to see on screen work together for the first time and why? Thanks for all your hard work. Uh, your show is the best on the internet, period. Well, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, well, for me, I'll feel this one first. For me, th- there's no question about it. The The team up I would love to see in a film is Daniel Day-Lewis and Russell Crowe. To me, right. the two best actors working the business. To me, they've been one and two and switching back and forth a bit over the past like five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, I've just never seen an actor with the type of range that Russell Crowe has um, and Daniel Day Lewis is just effing Daniel Day Lewis. I mean, he's Daniel Day Lewis. He's just that good. To see a film with these two guys in it at the same time, that to me would be like heat. You know, watching De Niro and Pacino, I, that would be like that for me. So, so that would be my pick. Anyway, Christian, what about you? Yeah, but going off of your, your, your pick there too is that those are both guys who just command your attention when they're acting. Oh, yeah. Like Russell Crowe is just a force. Like when you watch him and know it, there's just, there's just something about both of those guys. That, yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a great combination. My combination, I'm going a little younger. Um, guys that are just on the scene now and, and getting everybody's attention and always popping up on lists that people want them to be in movies, and that's Michael Fassbender and Tom Hardy. Oh, yeah. Love to see that combination. That would be great. Just the two of those guys doing a movie together, you'd, you'd be like, wait a minute, there's there's Bane and there's Magneto. And you're like, what <laughs> they're doing? It's like they can do anything. You put Don, uh, Tom Hardy, he's playing Elton John. And then he, now, he's playing, now he's in a gangster film. And then Michael Fassbender is, is, is in a period piece. And now he's Magneto. There's, there's nothing that these guys can't do. Very excited to see what they what they do. What was the name of that film that Fassbender did again where he was the sex addict? Um uh, shame. Shame. That's yeah. such a good and underappreciated film that not enough people saw. Uh, yeah. But you're right. These two guys are just proving more and more and more they can do absolutely anything. And I was stunned when I found out Hardy was going to be playing Elton John. Because that, I mean, right. if you want to talk about diversifying yourself, that is like, I never would have saw that coming. So if he can pull off Elton John, the dude can do anything. All right. Yeah, it's, it's a great combination. Last question today, and the last question today has the honor of going to Daniel Breeding, who writes, uh, Hey, sons of AMC, my question is, will we ever get a Family Guy movie? Kind of what The Simpsons did with their movie that was extremely successful. I think it's just a matter of time before we get one. And when do you think we'll get one, if one at all? Keep bringing the filthy. Um, well, Daniel, um, I, I can tell you this. I do know that uh, Seth MacFarlane is planning. He said about a year ago, I think it is, that they are indeed planning on doing a uh, Family Guy movie. And he said they were really, one of the reasons they were so excited about it was because he said, if we're going to do a movie, though, we don't just want to do a, an hour and a half version of one of our episodes. We want to push the limits and take advantage of the fact that we can be rated R and there's more stuff that we can do. He said, because you wouldn't believe all the stuff we've cut out of our TV show. And I, I believe it. Um, so I know they're planning to do it, but I believe he also once said that he wants to wait until Family Guy is no longer on the air. He said he saw what happened to the guys doing The Simpsons. Because the guys who did The Simpsons, uh, Matt Groening, he's even said, we will never do this again. Trying to do the show and do the movie at the same time. He said, nearly killed us. We'll never do this again. Um, So we'll probably see another Simpsons movie at some point, but it'll probably be after Simpsons off air. And I'm also guessing we're not going to see a Family Guy movie until it finishes uh, its run as well. Anyway, Christian, what have you heard or what do you think? Yeah, I think that um, it'll probably be after Family Guy ends, but, you know, not to crush the dreams of 
Family Guy fans, I don't think it's going to be on for that much longer because I think that Seth MacFarlane is really going after this movie career, and we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens with A Million Ways to Die in the West. Um, I am so excited for that movie, man. I'm, I'm on the s- fence. I'm excited for it. Are you? I'm on the fence with it only because it's again. Ted did. Some, Ted he was able to do what he does best, and that's yeah. the voice. He does the voice, and it worked. And you had Mark Wahlberg there back and forth. He's in the lead role now. I don't know how he is as an actor. Um, I'm skeptical as of him as an actor, but I could very well, after I see it, say, you know what, this guy is a comedy force. Looking forward to at least some of the jokes. I re- what I've read, I enjoy. I just. I don't know, but in regards to a Family Guy movie, I think that you're right. I think the show will be off the air when it happens. I do think it'll happen, and especially if this movie is successful and his future endeavors are su- su- excuse me successful. <laughs> I think you know one of the interesting things about Family Guy to me is that when and follow me here, when Family Guy is firing on all cylinders, to me it is one of the funniest things I've ever seen on TV. Like when it is really hitting and when it's really leveraging itself and, and, and utilizing these characters that they've defined so well. And even all the auxiliary characters in Family Guy are really, really funny, really, really rich. And it's just great. However, Family Guy is also one of those shows for me that when it's not firing on all cylinders, it can just seem kind of desperate to me. Yeah. So, I mean, I can turn on an episode of Family Guy and just laugh myself sick for, you know, 30 straight minutes. And then, you know, next week I turn on Family Guy and just be, uh, okay, I'm, I'm a little bored. Um, I, one of the things that turns me off, and this is about any filmmaker, any film, any television, show, any film or TV show, or whatever that gets preachy, I start to get a little bit turned off by that, and it doesn't matter what they're preaching. I, I, I get a little turned off when I feel like a, a movie's starting to preach at me, and sometimes McFarland does that. Sometimes McFarland likes to preach at people a bit, and sometimes that can turn me off, but I'm telling you, though, when it's firing, I love it, and I think if they can really focus themselves, make emotion, focus themselves for like a year on one quote-unquote 30-minute or 90-minute episode of Family Guy, I think it could be really funny. Like, would you be, if you find out this weekend, Christian, yeah. that a Family Guy movie was opening, would you come with me to the AMC Burbank 16 for opening night? Would you be, would you be that ex- excited about it? 100%, yeah, because it, it's delivered in the past. And the thing is, too, I think it goes back to your point as far as one of the reasons that I think that there are hit and miss episodes. Like the first couple seasons were mostly all hits. Hmm. And once, once you got, like, again, Seth MacFarlane is a busy, busy dude. And yeah. so once he starts going into production on Ted, he probably wasn't around as much. And when he's not around as much, you don't get as much of the, the creativity behind it. And it's, and you, sure, you got a team, but I'm, you don't have him, the brain right there. Is, and so I think that if he's going to commit to a movie, he's not going to commit to a movie unless he knows, let's give them the funniest stuff that we could possibly do. So absolutely, I would be there at the uh, AMC Theater to watch um, that movie on opening night. All right, well, that will do it for us, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. And don't forget, if you haven't done so already, click subscribe, become a subscriber to our YouTube channel, click the thumbs up button, just let us know that you like the show and it helps us out a lot too. Also, don't forget... If you want an audio-only version of this podcast, we now put AMC Mailbag in the podcast feed for AMC Movie Talk. So just look in the description of this video, and you'll find links to our Stitcher and our iTunes. I want to thank uh, one of the newest members here at AMC, Mr. Christian Harloff, for joining me. Christian, where can people find you online? Thank you, John. The, the people can find me on YouTube, youtube.com slash schmoesno, as well as Twitter at schmoesno. And uh, you can find me on the various social media channels at John Campia as I finish swallowing my water. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name's John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye.